I've been saying over and again that the word of God is supernatural and powerful. Whether it is the written word or the spoken word. But that the word of God will do you no good unless you put it in your heart and you speak it out of your mouth. I showed you last week that the word of God has got to be in two places. Romans chapter 10 from verse 8, the Bible says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. So the word has to be in your mouth and in your heart. If the word is not in your heart and it's not spoken out of your mouth, it will do you no good. Yes, this is a powerful word. Yes, this is a supernatural word. But until you put it in your heart and begin to speak it out of your mouth, it will not help you. I talked about people who would put Bibles under their pillows to sleep at night because they think to themselves when the devil shows up in their bedroom, the Bible under the pillow will fight off the devil. But I want you to understand the Bible under your pillow would do you no good. The Bible on its own does not ward off devils. The Bible does not have to be under your pillow every night. The Bible has to be in your heart. So when a devil shows up, you will speak what's in your heart and the devil would run. So the Bible says here in Romans chapter 10 that the word of God has to be in your heart and the word of God has to be in your mouth. Tell your neighbor in your heart and in your mouth. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus or that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I told you that, yes, I know we have used this place many times to lead sinners to the Lord. But I need you to understand that this is not only for leading sinners to the Lord, but these verses apply to every area of your life. With the heart man believes unto healing, with the mouth confession is made unto healing. With the heart man, man believes unto prosperity, and with the mouth confession is made unto prosperity. With the heart man believes unto peace, and with the mouth confession is made unto peace. The word has to be in your heart, and the word has to come out of your mouth. For death and life are in the power of the tongue, and he that loveth it must eat the fruit thereof. Can someone say amen? amen. I say, can someone say amen? amen? In Mark chapter 11 verse 23, Jesus said, For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. Whoever says, you say it with your mouth, you tell the problem that he's got to give way, that it has no right to stay in your home, it has no right to stay on your children, it has no right to stay in your business, it has no right to stay near you. You've got to speak to the mountain. Nowhere does the Bible say speak about the mountain. Nowhere does the Bible say caress the mountain. Nowhere does the Bible say praise the mountain. The Bible say you speak to the mountain. A lot of people are talking about the mountain. The Bible does not say talk about it. The Bible says speak to it. And the reason why many are not seeing the mountains before they move is because they are talking about the mountains too much. You're going around telling everybody how you feel. You're going around telling everybody how the devil is fighting you and how the devil is making a mess of your life. And the more you talk about it, the bigger the problem gets. Can someone say, God help me? Amen. You speak to it, not about it. You tell it to move. The Bible says, if you say to the mountain, be moved and be cast into the sea, and you do not doubt in your heart. So we have established that faith and doubt, or faith and unbelief, are in the heart, not in the mind. Notice Jesus did not say 
if you don't doubt in your mind. There are many times that I have been believing for something and I have faith in my heart even though the enemy is putting negative thoughts in my mind. But I have learned something, and I want you to learn it this morning. You learn how to disconnect your heart from your mind. If you keep listening to the negativities in your mind, you will never step into the plan of God. Because all those thoughts are coming to paralyze you and to weigh you down and to talk you out of faith. When the devil came to Jesus after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, you've got to understand that the temptation took place in Jesus' mind. The devil did not necessarily show up in front of Jesus and get into this contest with Jesus. No, the devil was speaking. Guys, I'm ringing. If you guys can do something about it. The mic has been ringing. There is so much echo. Um, so Jesus did not... See the devil face to face. Rather, the devil was speaking to his mind. Everyone say his mind. his mind. And the mind is the battleground of any Christian. If you lose the battle in your mind, you've lost. Battles are won and battles are lost in the mind. That's what the Bible says. Casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And bringing them into captivity. How do you cast down imaginations? How do you bring them into captivity? By using the word of God to bring down every thought, to bring down every suggestion, to bring down every idea that the enemy throws into your mind. If you don't bring them down and you let them sit there for a week, I tell you they will get into your heart. And when they get into your heart, they're going to be established in your life. Get rid of every negative thought. Did you hear what I said? Get rid of every negative thought. You see those thoughts that have been coming to you and telling you how worthless you are? Get rid of them because you are not worthless. I say you are not worthless. You are a child of God. You have been made to sit together with Jesus in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers, above every name, above every title, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. The Bible says you are the head and not the tail. You are a city on the hill that cannot be hid. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Amen. You are a child of God. If you have given your heart to Jesus, let no devil lie to you and tell you you are a, you are a worm. Because you are not a worm. The devil is the worm. And if the enemy comes and he begins to remind you of the things you've done five years ago, I think you need to tell the devil, look, I don't know who you're talking about. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if a man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The, the word there, creation, is in the Greek a new species of being. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Tell the devil, I'm a new creature in Christ. The person you're talking about is dead and gone. And if you've been through water baptism, in actual fact, you need to tell the devil, I was at his funeral. I saw when he was buried, and I tell you, you are not talking about me. Can someone say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter, uh, chapter 8, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation to a born-again believer in Christ. If the devil comes to you and begins to speak to you how broke you are, how you wouldn't be able to pay your rent, how bleak your future looks, you tell the devil, no, 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 I'm not broke because the Bible says that he set me free from poverty. The Bible says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Bible says the Lord will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible says and God is able to make all grace abound 
abound toward me, that I always having all sufficiency in all things will abound unto every good work. Can someone give God praise and glory in the house this morning? My God, the way, the way some of you are looking at me, you're wondering, my God, what is this man talking about? I'm talking about who you are in Christ. I'm talking about who you are and the things you possess as a child of the living God. Don't let no devil come and lie to you and talk you out of the blessings that God has made available to you in Jesus. But you see, you've got to be so full of the word. Because see, it is the word that fights back and pushes back the tide of, of the devil. It is the word that fights back and pushes back on the pressure that the enemy brings your way. Don't let the devil pressurize you. You pressurize him. Some people wait until the devil comes and smack them up the side of the head. The devil comes and he starts wreaking havoc in their lives. That is when they begin to look in the Bible. <laughs> Don't wait until then. Start to look in the word now. Tell your neighbor, look in the word now. Praise the Lord. I showed you that the word of God is liking to mill. Everyone say mill. I also showed you, number two, the word of God is liking to solid food. Well, if you were not here with us last Sunday, you need to go to our website and look at this because it's posted already on our website on, on our church's Facebook page. So you can go and, and, and listen to the message I preached last week. The word of God is liking to milk. The word of God is liking to solid food. Number two, the word of God is liking to mirror. Did you look in the mirror this morning? <laughs> you look like you looked in the mirror today. <laughs> Amen. The word of God is liking to water. That's number four. And I give several scriptures for all of these. Amen. Number five. I finished number five. I said the word of God is liking to his sword. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter six and verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we can see that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Bible also tells us in Revelation chapter 19 verse 15, it says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. So now we understand that the sharp sword the Bible is talking about here is not a literal sword, but it's the Word. So how did the, the Lord defeat the devil by the Word? How is he going to defeat the devil even in the war of Armageddon? It is by Word. Can someone shout Amen. So let's continue. Number six. The word of God is liking to fire. <laughs> I like this one. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse, I'm sorry, chapter 20 and verse 9. The Bible says, then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak anymore in his name. But his word was in my mouth. Or was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. The word of God is like fire. Can someone say amen? amen. In Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 29 it says. It's not my word like a fire. Says the Lord. So the word of God is like what? Fire. The message we preach. Is a fiery and hot message. This gospel is not a cold gospel. This gospel is a hot gospel. You've got to put the word in your heart and every time you speak it out of your mouth, it will come out of your mouth like fire. The Bible says a fire goes before him and burns up all his enemies. Even as I speak the word of God with authority and with fire, all the enemies of your life, all the things that have been coming against you, if you open your heart and receive this, this word will burn up everything that the devil has placed in your life. If you believe it, give the Lord a big shout of praise. <laughs> this is a hot message. This is a fiery message. A lot of people go to the church of icicles. And the church of the cold. I was telling somebody a few days ago. I said the church you attend matters a lot. Because if the church is cold, you will be cold. I don't care how hot you are today. If you hang out with cold people long enough, you are also going to become cold. 
The place you worship matters. If the pastor is cold, you will be cold. If the people that you are around are cold, you will be cold. Before you know it, you look like you're living this Scandinavia. I'm telling you, you're going to be so cold. You're going to be so cold. But praise God, we have people in the Scandinavia that are hot, like our brother here. This man is hot on fire. One of the, one of the members of the river in Helsinki. Amen. Hot brother. Hot in the Holy Ghost. Hot on fire. The whole family is hot. Can someone say amen? amen. The church is hot. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we have several hot churches in the Scandinavia. Amen. amen. But if you hang out with people that are cold, and I tell you before you know it, the coldness of the people shall begin to rub off on you. And before you know it, your fire has disappeared. And you wonder, how come I'm not hot anymore? Well, you're not hot anymore because you're hanging out with the wrong people. We have a hot church in this place. Amen. If people in the front are saying amen, in the back I, I did not hear amen. amen but one person. I said we have a hot church in this place. <laughs> Can someone say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is my word not like a fire? This word is able to burn every chaff out of your life. This word, when we preach it with understanding and revelation and authority, the power and the fire of the word will burn in the hearts of men. And all the things the devil has been doing in their lives will be burnt up. Praise the Lord. So this is not a cold gospel. You preach this message anywhere, you will get the result that this word brings. I don't care how bound people are. Preach it with power. Preach it with authority. And the word will produce a result. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2. From verse 22. It says men of Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested by God. To you by miracles, wonders and signs. Which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Skip down to verse 37. Now when they heard this. They were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now you have to understand who is preaching this message. This is Peter. The guy who days ago was denying knowing Jesus. The guy who three times said, I do not know him. Even before a little girl, the Bible says Peter said, I never saw him before. He denied. Why did he deny? Because he was afraid. Why did he deny? Because when he saw what Jesus was going through, he knew that it was terrible for anyone to go through something like this. And what happened? His boldness disappeared. But guess what happened? Acts chapter 2. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the house where they were in. And there appeared upon each of them cloven tongues like as of fire. Tell your neighbor fire. Fire fell on each person. Fire fell on Peter. The same guy who denied Jesus. Now he has the boldness to preach Jesus. He looked the people in the face and he told them, You crucified Jesus. You gave him up to the Gentiles. You gave him up to the Romans. You 
crucified him. And as he spoke the word with boldness, the fire of God was released in that place. Why? Because when you have the fire of God upon your life and you preach this fiery gospel, it is not possible for your listeners to remain the same. This fire will fall on them. This fire will convict them. This fire will change them. This fire will transform their lives. And guess what they said? They began to ask Peter, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The word is fire. Praise God. My God, you know, there are times you have stuff against you, things just coming against you, and you've done everything you know to do. But one thing you've never done is you've never taken the word and speak that word out of your mouth. What you need to begin to do is to take the word and begin to speak the word out of your mouth. And guess what? Every attack of the enemy against your life will be destroyed. The word of God is fire. If you don't release it out of your mouth, you would not see the potency of the word. You would not see the power of the word. The Bible says, is my word not like fire? And the answer is this. Yes, Lord, your word is like fire. Amen. Number seven. The word of God is like, like a hammer. Hmm. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. It's not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. I like that. The word is like a hammer. You know, when I preach, I'm hammering away. Oh my God, some people don't know that's what I do when I preach. I'm just hammering away. I'm hammering away because I look at some people, they come and they look like. But I just keep hammering away. I just keep pounding. I just keep pounding. I don't know if, if, any, if any of you here have ever used a hammer to break something down. Some things are very strong, it does not break down in a day. Or it does not break down the first time you hammer it. It takes a while. But if you don't give up, this thing is going to fall. Are you listening to me? Some people's hearts are like that. They come to church and you look at them. And you're preaching a hot message. You're preaching a strong word. But they look like they are here, but they are not home. But I just keep hammering. I just keep hammering. I just keep hammering. I just keep, ha- I just keep pounding the word. I keep pounding the word. Sometimes it takes a week for them to get it. Some other people it takes a month. Some it takes like six months. But one day they get it. The day they get it, you see their eyes lighting up. Their face changes. You realize that, oh, now, now, now they got it. Now now they got it. You know what? Because if we don't give up hammering the word, people's lives are definitely going to change. Listen to me. I'm a big believer in the word. I don't care where you're coming from. I know that this word will change you. I believe it with all of my heart. We've seen people come here whose lives were totally messed up. Totally messed up. Their life was a mess. But when they came and sat under the word, this word began to do something in their hearts. Because this word is like hammer. And even though the heart seems strong and tough and hard, but this word is stronger. This word is harder. This word is powerful. This word is quick. This word will break through the heart of any man. As long as they sit under the word, something must happen. I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care what the devil has done in your life in the past. I don't care what you've done. But when you sit under this anointed word, this word will break your heart in pieces. And when it breaks your heart in pieces, the word will pierce into your heart and the change will begin. A lot of people have spent 20 years messing up their lives and they come to church and expect to see a 
change the day they arrive. No, it does not happen the day you arrive. It begins the day you arrive. But God continuously walks in your heart and continuously change you. And as you open your heart to God's word, this word will transform you. When you look at your life five years down the road, you'll be amazed at what God has done. Is there anyone in the house this morning who can look back to five years ago? Who can look back to two years ago? Who can look back to ten years ago and they can say, my life is not the same again. If that is you, then lift your voice and give God all the glory in the house this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> my word is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Don't give up. Keep preaching the word. Don't give up. Keep sowing the word. Don't give up. Keep putting the word even in the hardest places of your life. You look at your life, if you, can, if you can break your life down into compartments, into divisions, you look at your life, you realize that there are places you struggle the most. True or false? Oh yeah, there are places you struggle the most. And what you need to do to break through in those places is to take the word of God and put the word of God continuously in those places. If you don't give up, the word will not give up. I say, if you don't give up, the word will not give up. If you keep putting the word in those places where you struggle, the word is going to break those places open, and you're going to begin to see the word of God flourish in your life. Can someone shout amen? amen. Tell your neighbor the word is like a hammer. <laughs> I like that. The word is like a hammer. Breaks the rocks. So, Lord, I pray today, every difficult and hard heart, break them by your word. Amen. Break them by your word. Amen. That not one person will leave this place with a difficult heart, with a hard heart. Break them today. Amen. And the more we preach the truth, because you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The more we preach the truth, the freer people become. And that people, be, people realize that the place where they've been struggling for five years, for ten years, it's becoming easy and now they're having the victory. It is the will of God for you to have the victory. It is the will of God for you to live in His plan and purpose for your life. It is the will of God for you to obey His plan and obey His word and run with God's purpose for your life. Can someone say amen? amen. But God's word has got to come and change you. I told you last week, I said, look, I, I believe that you get a certain percentage of your spiritual growth or spiritual food in this place. And, and I'm talking about those who even come uh, every time the door is open. There are some of you I see once in a while. But even if you come here on Sunday, you come on Wednesday, you come on Thursday, you come to the youth ministry... You come to the Bible school, there's a certain percentage you get. In my personal walk with God, I have realized that most of the things that God's done in my life to bring about change and growth were done in private. Private. God has done a lot in my life in public. God has done a lot. God has touched me amazingly in this church. I've wept many times. I've laughed many times. I've rolled on the floor many times. The fire of God has come upon me many times. The anointing, tangible, manifested presence of God has come upon me many times. I've, I love all of this. But I've realized that as a Christian, most of the things that God has done in my life to bring me to the level of growth and where I am today was done in a place of privacy. A place of intimacy. A place of intimacy. Did you get that? The word int intimacy can be looked as into me. See, it's a place of one-on-one. -on -one. It's a place where I shut everyone out and I go before God. And I spend time with him and I spend time in his word. Most of the things that I preach, really all that I preach, I get in a place of privacy. Are you listening to me? Listen, sometimes when I hear other people preach, I get inspired. I get inspired by every word I preach, every message I preach has come to me in a place of privacy, in a place where it's just me and God. 
And sometimes even in the most unlikely places. The most unlikely, like in the toilet. <laughs> oh, some of you thought God does not speak when you're in the toilet. He speaks everywhere. Thank you. He speaks everywhere. In the most unlikely places. God comes, he speaks. On the bus, in the midst of people, God comes, he speaks. For some people, they depend on the church for their spiritual growth. And that is good. I'm not saying you should not. But you've got to understand that God wants you to come to Him in a place of privacy and intimacy. Because there are so many things that God wants to do in your life. And God cannot do these things in your life until you give Him time. Are you listening to me? The Word of God is like, number eight, Word of God is liking to a foundation. I want to say foundation. Now, if you look at a building uh, and you look at how nice it looks, state of the art equipment and uh, nice building, skyscraper built with glass and I mean all kinds of awesome materials. You go into this building and it looks, looks good. But there is something about a building that you don't see. Most of the time. And that's the foundation. You know they say that the foundation of a building. Or the depth of the foundation of a building depends on the height of the building. In other words, the higher the building, the taller the building, the deeper the foundation. The foundation you use for a two-story building... It's not the same you use for a 30-story building. Did you hear me? So how tall do you want to go in God? How big do you want to go in God? You've got to let the Word of God be the foundation of your life. Say, the deeper God can do in you, the deeper God can do through you. The only thing that stops you from going to the places where God wants you to go to is the refusal to change. <laughs> if you would let the word of God go deep, God would do more through you. Amen. And I tell you, I don't want to get to the other side of eternity and be told... God will look at all you should have done. You did not do them because you refused to change. You did not do them because you refused to let me go deep into your life. Because the deeper God can do, the more you change. Can someone say amen? amen. Let me speak to husbands and wives. Listen to me. Husbands, don't try to change your wife. You, you can't do it. Wives, don't try to change your husbands. You, you don't have the ability. When you learn that and you take your hands off, you will have some peace in your life. The only thing that changes us is the word of God. That's the only thing that changes us. When we allow God's word go deep into our hearts, that's when we change. The deeper the revelation, the more God can do through you. The deeper the foundation, the taller you get in the spirit. Can someone shout amen? amen. Jesus tells us here in Matthew chapter 7, we read from verse 24... Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. Everyone say wise man. 
which built his house upon a rock. Notice, whoever hears these sayings of mine and do them. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and do them. You know many hear what they don't do. The Bible says don't be hearers only. Deceiving your own self. But be doers of his word. <laughs> you know what happens when you hear and hear and hear and hear and you don't do, you don't do, you don't do. Your heart becomes deceived. And the worst thing about deception is it is deceiving. Your heart will be so deceived, but you think you're okay. I've seen so many deceived Christians. They shack up in the same house with the girl they are not married to or with the man they are not married to. But they come to church together and they shout, praise the Lord. Your heart is deceived. But you think you're good. You think you're okay. You do your religious duty. You kneel down in the morning to pray. You just got off the bed. <laughs> and you tell me, but pastor, I want to marry her. Marry her first. I'm touching a very sensitive subject right now. I know people are going to be nervous. But I've got to do it. Because deception is running rampant within the body of Christ. Many so-called Christians are deceived. They are on their way to the lake of fire. They just don't know it. And someone has to look them in the face and tell them, if you close your eyes in death like this, you are going to hell and you will burn forever. Someone has to tell them that. Someone has to develop the boldness and the guts to tell them that. But I'm telling you in love. Because if you die like this, you are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and brimstones. And that's not a plan of God for anyone. The worst thing to happen to someone who comes to church is to go to hell from church. Don't deceive yourself. The Bible says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. He that sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap life everlasting. Stop sowing to the flesh and lying to yourself and telling yourself, I am good. You are not good. You are deceived. Deception is the biggest thing the devil is using in these days. Many are deceived. They won't go to church and they say they are okay. No, you are not okay. The Bible said, do not neglect the gathering together of yourselves as you see the day approaching as the nature of some is. Don't tell me you are good when you know that what you're doing is contrary to the word of God. This is the final decision. And if my life is not in line with this word and I say I'm okay, that is deception. And that's a, that is pride. And you know what the Bible says about those who are in pride? The Bible says God will resist the proud, but God will give grace to the humble. That's the big difference between David and King Saul. Whenever David sinned, he went to God. He cried out, I'm sorry, forgive me. He owned up to his sin. But when Saul sinned, Saul said, I'm good, no problem. It's okay. No problem. Saul had just sinned against God. Guess what? When Samuel the prophet came, Saul said, Samuel, I've done what the Lord told me to do. Samuel said, no, you haven't. What's the bleating of sheep that I hear? Who is that king that I see over there? That's Agag, the king. Why didn't you destroy everything that the Lord told you to do? Saul, Saul said, I did everything. No, you didn't do everything. I hear the sheep bleating. I hear the king talking. And you tell me you did everything? God said, go in there and wipe everything out. But you went in there. You did not want to wipe everything out for your own selfish purpose. And yet you say, I've done everything. That is deception. Deception is when you are deceived and you think you're good. Are you here this morning? 
Deception is why you know you're living contrary to what the word of God says. You say, but we live in Istanbul. That's why we're doing it. <laughs> Pastor, I'm sorry. You know the situation in the country. We have to compromise here and there. A man was bringing his girl. He wanted to marry her. And he said, I have no other place to keep her. Because... Uh, I don't have the money. Then don't marry. Wait until you have the money. Come on now. No, don't give me excuse. Don't give me all those excuses. I'm preaching good. You're going, you're going to like me today or you might just leave this place and never come back. But if you don't like me, you've got to love me. Because the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Should I write on? He that hears these words of mine and do them. Do them. Do them. Stop calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I tell you. Many shall come to me on that day and they shall say, Lord, did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not do this and do that in your name? And I shall say to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. For I never knew you. You know, so many places don't preach these messages anymore. It's all about what you can get and the kind of car you can drive and the kind of uh, suits you can wear and the kind of house you can live in. It's all fluff. It's all cover up. It's all a smoke screen. There is no substance. We've got to preach the truth. It is the truth that sets people free. And I tell you, a lot of people are afraid to, pre afraid to preach the truth because they think if I begin to preach this kind of message, the church will reduce in number. No! When you preach this kind of message, those that want to serve God will come. Those that want to live for God will come. And these are the people you need. You don't need those who don't want to serve God. You need those who want to live for God. You need those who want to live a holy life. You need those who want to live a life that is pure and sanctified. You need those who want to run with the vision of God. You need those that are humble. Those that are men and women of integrity. Those are the people you need because those are the people you can do something with. Hallelujah. <laughs> this Friday, I'm coming to the youth ministry. I have a word for, for the youth. <laughs> the Lord has put, I tell you, the Lord's put a message on my heart for the youth. It's been on my heart for like three, four months. So I told Eric Gould, I, I invite him, I'm inviting myself. <laughs> <laughs> This, thir this, thir this Friday, it's Friday, right? Friday, 7 p.m. You don't want to miss it. There's going to be deliverance in this place. <laughs> it's going to be good. It'll be good. It'll be good. It's going to be awesome. Don't miss it. The young people are thinking, that what, why is it coming? What is he bringing? <laughs> yeah, I'm bringing my rod and my staff. <laughs> because Psalm number 23, the Bible said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're both going to comfort you this Friday. <laughs> and all the young people shout, praise the Lord. Praise that praise the Lord was so weak, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's going to be awesome this Friday, I'm telling you. You don't want to miss it. If you don't come to Dunamis, I want to invite you to join us this Friday. You, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to be talking about some, I'm going to be talking about purity. It's going to be good. 
sexual purity. Oh, it's going to be good. I tell you, it's going to be very good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I like, I mean, our young people are amazing people, I'm telling you. Our young people. Somebody was telling my wife just a few days ago. So whenever you see people from your church, your young people, sometimes she would, they would go over there and the guy said, whenever I will see your young people, when I hear them speak, I know that these guys are different. So your, your people are different. The guy said, I don't come to your church, but I, I watch Pastor Gonzil on, on online a lot. And your, your young people are amazing. Your young people are amazing. said they dress well, they carry themselves with respect and honor. They, they are just awesome. So this Friday, I'm coming to encourage you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone say amen. 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 He that heareth these words of mine and do them, I liken him unto a wise man. Who built his house upon a rock? The rock here is the word. Which is basically the foundation of your life. Amen. Amen. So if you obey God's word, you have a solid foundation. Stop hearing and not doing. Begin to do. The words you hear will judge you. Begin to do God's word. Begin to obey God's word. And notice what it says, and it says, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. It did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. I don't care what is happening in the world today. If your life is built upon the truth of the word, it will not move you. The Bible says the righteous is like Mount Zion. That abides forever and cannot be moved. Nothing will move you. Nothing will shake you if you obey God's word. Don't hear God's word and say, I would like to do it, but. That but is the problem. <laughs> and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. Now, Jesus said, it's not me. In other words, Jesus is saying some are wise and some are foolish. No, even think about Matthew 25. Jesus gives the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. He said, five were wise and five were foolish. Is that right? Five were what? Wise and five were what? Foolish. 50% wise, 50% foolish. I pray there are wise people here today. Amen. So this foolish who does not do the word is liking unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I want you to notice the same elements that came on the house built on the rock, came on the house built on the sand. I want to say the same elements. <laughs> and that implies that no one here is immune to life's challenges. Everyone here goes through challenges, don't you? Now, you go through challenges because if challenges don't come, you will not grow. Someone say, Lord, give me a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> you need a miracle when there is a challenge. Is that right? Amen. But when challenges come, it will reveal the quality you are made of. Did you hear me? It will reveal the quality you are made of. What's your quality? Challenge will reveal it. The last but not the least, the word of God is liking to light. Everyone say light. 
Psalms 119 and verse 108, 105, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Notice it says, notice thy word is a lamp and a light. So the word of God is liking to light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, but if we walk in the light, now we understand, notice in the psalm, in the psalm we read, it says your word is a light. Is that right? And no, now 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light. So if the word is light, so what is 1 John saying? If we walk in the word. Are you seeing that? But if we walk in the light, or we can say if you walk in the word, as he is in the word, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin. What does light do? Light illuminates. Illuminates the darkness of your life. It helps you to find your path. So you don't stumble or bump your foot against anything. Is that true? So think about walking into a place and it's total, total darkness. You've never been there. I'm not talking about your house now. You've never been there. You're going to try to find your way, right? You're going to do this. And before you know it, you're going to bump your feet to something and you might get hurt. There might be some broken bottles on the ground. There might be some sharp objects on the ground. There might be something that will pierce your face. Is that right? It's dangerous to walk in the dark. Is that true? And when you walk in the dark, it means you don't know where you're going. The word of God will illuminate the darkness. Not Listen, nobody here today should walk in darkness in any area. I look at people here this morning and, and, and I tell you there are people here this morning that do not know where their life is headed. You're walking in the dark. You don't even know what's going to be the outcome of your life. You stand at the crossroads of life. It doesn't seem as if there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's all dark. I look at some people, I ask them, what's God saying to you? What are you going to do? What's the plan of God for your life? No vision. They're confused. That's not a plan of God for anybody. I tell you, anybody, that's not a plan of God for you. <laughs> the word of God is light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him. The light of his word will illuminate. When you open God's word and you begin to read God's word, guess what happens? Light comes to you. A lot of times, you know, people are seeking answers from the wrong places. The answer is not in your friend. The answer is not in the economy. The answer is not in the news. The answer is in his word. Are you listening now? Your word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. So when the word of God comes and lighting up the darkness, you are not walking in darkness, you're walking in light. The Bible says, the entrance of thy word brings light. God wants to bring light to you. Amen. God wants to bring light to you. I said, God wants to bring light to you. Amen. I said, God wants to bring light to you. Amen. I said, God wants to bring light. Amen. Light. Light to your family, light to your business, light to your home, light to your marriage, light to your future, light to your vision, light to everything that God has called you to do. You are not here today by accident. God has allowed you to come because God is speaking His truth and His word to you. Because God wants to lighten the darkness of your life and God wants to bring you to a place of purpose. God has a purpose for your life. Can someone shout amen? amen? If you are devoid of the words, you will bump, you'll be bumping your feet into stuff. John chapter 1, the Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was uh, nothing made that was made in him was life. And the life was the light of men. <laughs> 
and the light shineth in darkness, and darkness could not comprehend it, or darkness could not fight it off. I've never seen darkness and light fight. I don't care how dark it is. When light comes, darkness must disappear. Praise the Lord. That's what you have here in this place. Light. Light. But you see, these things are not possible and these things are not accessible until Jesus becomes the Lord of your life. These are benefits for the new believer. These are benefits for those that have been saved. These are benefits for those who have given their hearts to Jesus. These are not benefits for everybody. The way to come in today is to accept the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that you shall be saved. Believe what? Believe that he is Lord. Confess what? Confess that he is the Lord of your life. The Bible says you shall be saved. Can someone say amen?